thank you all for being here. Um, and in particular, I'm glad uh, and thankful that Tom Luce has agreed to be here. Uh, I was I was thinking about this. Every every state and the country generally needs needs more people like Tom Luce to play the leadership role that he's played. But Texas, in particular, uh, is is so fortunate to have Tom Luce for the last several decades playing the leadership roles that he's played. So we're thrilled to have him tonight here tonight. And I'm going to start a little bit, we're going to talk a little bit chronologically. I'm going to take the first 20 or 30 minutes of this and ask Tom some questions and turn turn to all of you. Uh, but first, let me just start. You went to SMU for law school and and then you uh, practiced law and then started your own firm. What made you decide to become a lawyer? Well, you know, it's interesting. It didn't seem to be as complicated back in those days. <laughs> and uh, I, I really... I. Uh, kind of accidentally bumped into it. I felt like I needed a graduate education. SMU had a night law school. The, the SMU did not have a business school at night. And I was married when I was 19, had two children by the time I was 21. I said, you know, I think I'll get a law degree because <laughs> I could go at night and uh, work in the daytime and support my family. So it was a very complicated decision. Highly thought through. <laughs> I specialize in systems transformation and analytical thinking, but that. And you uh, ultimately started your own firm in your early thirties, and uh, you might tell the story which you've told me uh, about how you ultimately started working with Ross Perot. Well, first I want to note the banking business had changed because I was able to start my own law firm by signing an unsecured note with no assets, no <laughs> business plan. <laughs> yes, the banking business has changed. Yeah. And that enabled me to start the law firm. Yeah. Um, huh. And about a year after I started the law firm, um, a friend of mine recommended to Ross Perot that he interview me for a project, which was an unfortunate project for him, he, uh, he had invested in what had become the second largest stock brokerage firm in the country, and it was going under uh, in 1971. Wall Street was collapsing. Merrill had acquired the third largest brokerage firm. He was persuaded to acquire the second largest. Hmm. And uh, then the oil embargo hit. He ended up putting seventy million dollars into it and said, "I've had all the fun I can stand, and all the patriotism I can stand." And he said, "I want to close it and go home." And I'm looking for a lawyer to liquidate the brokerage firm. And he somehow interviewed a New York firm and a Washington firm and chose this five-person brand new firm in Dallas who had no corporate clients and no real Wall Street experience to handle the liquidation. And that was. Uh, the break that obviously was like a rocket booster to my legal career, and I'm forever grateful to him. And you ultimately spent 25 plus or minus years uh, doing, as was discussed, Mark mentioned, doing mergers, uh, doing restructurings, other transactions. And then through uh, somewhere along the line there, you made a decision uh, to change, uh, change your path. And what, how did that happen? I did. I was um, 59 years old and um, had been very, you know, I've tried to explain to my seven grandsons, um, I could not have been born in a better place at a better time than Texas in 1940. And slowly but surely, you know, for a while I thought, no, it's because I'm bright and smart and all that good jazz, but then I learned I was really body surfing on ocean waves that other people had created, and I'd been extremely blessed. And if I'd have been born in um, Kansas or, or Africa or any other place, I wouldn't have had the same opportunities. And I was very concerned uh, that not as many uh, young people were having the same opportunities that I had. I was raised by a single parent mother who did not have a college degree, later determined she was paranoid schizophrenic. I was raised by an alcoholic father. But I got a wonderful public education experience. A lot of people gave me a break along the way. 
I, I was a beneficiary of what I later began to call transactional philanthropy. That is to say, people appeared in my life as surrogate fathers or teachers or coaches or whatever. But it really became abundantly clear to me, uh, thanks to Ross Perot, in the 80s, I was, uh, he volunteered me to serve as chief of staff of an effort to improve Texas public schools, and I traveled all over the state. And I saw that uh, literally millions of children were not getting the same opportunities that I had, and that stuck with me and made quite an impact on me. And I'd been very fortunate, and I decided it was time for me to leave the law practice and see what I could do to improve opportunities for others. And one of the first things you did in a couple of years, you founded the National Center for Education Accountability. And you've described to me you're more, you're, you're really, you realize you're really an entrepreneur, but a social entrepreneur. Uh, wh what was the National Center for Education Accountability? And I think 2001 it was founded. What, how, how did you manage, uh, how did you do that and why did you do it? Well, what I started uh, through just for the kids and National Center for Educational Accountability, I was frustrated by the fact that I knew from personal experience that there were islands of health and strength in public schools that worked in every single environment in this state, and I expanded that to 44 states. I could prove to anybody that there were public schools that worked with any population you want to name, any poverty level you want to name, any race, ethnicity, mixture. I'd done all the data analytics. And I wanted to share with the public. I think the public at times gets overwhelmed by public education. At first you had to explain to them we had a problem. Now you have to explain to them we have a solution. And I want to explain, no, this really is possible. Here are examples that work. Let's determine what their best practices are. Let's replicate it. You know, let's attack this problem strategically, tactically. And that was the whole thrust of that uh, effort was to mount a national campaign to really use data, not to point fingers, but to determine what were the best practices that would that are working, just like an enterprise would do. You know, if you're Walmart, you try to find out who's doing the best distribution job and you go study what are they doing and how, how can we do continuous improvement and and that's what we need to do in public but it's doable I mean the good news is we have proven that you can deliver a first-rate public education to any kind of enrollment you want to name and I can show you a school that works so given that uh, if you look back 20 years ago today, is the state of U.S. public education better or worse? And if this problem is solvable, why isn't get why isn't it getting addressed? Well, we took our foot off the pedal. Let me let me use Texas as an example. In the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, but for about 15 to 20 years, we led the nation in academic improvement of Hispanic, African American low-income kids in rate of progress we exceeded every other state in the country and then in 2005 hmm. we decided to lower standards lower state funding lower assessment we we basically just kind of said oh well you know uh we don't need to you know, do any more. And we move roughly from about 49th when we started education reform in 83. Our attitude was thank God for Mississippi because we were about 49th. <laughs> no offense to anybody here, but we, we welcome all newcomers, including Mississippi. But uh, we were about 49th. We moved up to about 25th. And now we're back in the 40s because we took our eye off the ball. And and we've obviously got very rational leadership of our state. You've got very active business community. Why did why did that happen? Why do you think that happened? Well, our politics, uh, long term thinking is maybe today's tweet. If lucky, next November. Um, 
and we used to have a little bit longer. And I'm totally convinced that most of the problems that government deals with is just like we deal in business. Uh, we're dealing with an enormous amount of disruption, social change, systems transformation, and that does not occur overnight and does not occur by one election cycle. It occurs when you have a long-term plan and you're disciplined about how much system it can take in terms of change. You know, I've used this example. If you think back to the what AT&T has undergone the last, um, well, since 79 they were broken up, you could not have transformed or imagined trans transforming AT&T into what it is today overnight. Well, the same is true of public education. If you look at it as a business enterprise, it has 5.5 million customers, 450,000 employees, uh, 6,500 business units or campuses, and spends billions of dollars, and you want to transform it overnight. You can't do that overnight. So it takes a vision, and it takes continuous improvement, and it takes discipline, and our political system is not very geared to those principles today, nor are they using data. Um, I happen to believe that data is our friend. In education, I developed a motto of necessity. Without data, you're just another person with an opinion. Hmm. Um, I once had a former governor of the state tell me I had to quit talking about education. And I said, why, governor? It's my passion. He said, Tom, you don't understand. Everybody went to public school, so everybody's an expert on schools. And I said, I understand, governor, <laughs> but maybe we could supply some data as to what's working. So I, I think it's all of the above, but the point is it's doable. Are there five or ten states in the country you would look to and say, boy, they do a good job at this? Yes. Um, Massachusetts has set the bar. And let me say, folks, they have as much diversity and much poverty as we do. You look at their population, I've studied very carefully, they have just as much um, poverty, just as much diversity, just as much poverty in the inner cities. They set high standards. They hold people accountable. Uh, they're doing a good job. Tennessee's come a long way in the last 15 to 20 years. They've had a enormous coalition of business leadership that stepped forward, hmm. demanded change. Uh, Jeb Bush did a great job in Florida. There are states, and we face increasing competition. Uh, again, Texas state government is no different than any other enterprise. You have to look out and see who our new competitors are. We're now competing increasingly against the North Carolinas, the Tennessees, the Florida. We may have gotten everybody out of California that wants to work. I don't know. Um, uh, same is true of New York. And so we're competing against different competitors. And it's just like in war, competitors get a vote. And so they saw our low tax environment, our business-friendly environment. They're becoming more competitive, but they're paying attention to their education system. The fact of the matter is we're out of educated workforce in this state. The data today, we have 1.2 million unfilled jobs, and we have 500,000 unemployed people. How are we going to expand? Uh, that's full employment. Now, I shouldn't be talking full employment no, that's, that's in full the employment. Fed. <laughs> no, I'd uh, call that full employment. Yeah. I agree with you. But, but we're running out of educated workforce, and business cannot expand. So let's talk about, let's jump right to 2036. You've done a lot of things in between uh, the last 20 years, but the most recent initiative I want to spend some time on, which is Texas 2036. When did you start it? And they just explain to folks who may not know, what is it uh, and what exactly are you doing? Well, I decided to start it about uh, two and a half, three years ago. I first did it silently. I wanted to make sure it was needed and I could build support for it across the state. Um, and it came through a frustration of 
uh, dealing in what I call silos of policy and advocacy. And there's nothing wrong with silos. Uh, I've advocated in every silo in this state. I've advocated for K through 12 infrastructure, ports, super colliders, mental health. But at the end of the day, a state uh, and our state government has one unique difference between it and Washington. We cannot print money and we have to balance the budget. The state government just passed a budget of $250 billion. And the strategic question of any enterprise, particularly state government, is how do you allocate scarce resources? And if you advocate in silos, you don't get the connections. You know, I worked on K through 12 and sooner or later, you know what? You know, water supply may really matter if kids are not drinking healthy water and they come to school. Or what if they can't get to school? Or what if they haven't had their booster shot? Or what if they have trauma at home? And I learned the hard way about the interconnection of all these issues and the lack of a strategic view as to how to tackle all the above and do it with a strategic allocation of uh, resources so that the state let me say this. I believe, through my personal experience, the private sector creates jobs. How do you keep creating jobs, keep a business-friendly environment, but address human needs? And I think that takes long-term planning. It goes back to systems transformation, long-term planning, incremental change, building a coalition to in insist the public sector do that and hold them accountable, and having the data to say, no, let me show you the data. Let me show you what it really looks like. Let us, and so the first thing we did was accumulate over 300 public data sets. And we began to project because I wanted to be able to travel the state and go to CEOs, business executives and say, okay, I know your first reaction. We're doing great. We lead the nation in job growth, all those things, all of which is true. But I wanted to project, based upon data, where Texas would be in 2036 if we kept doing what we were doing. So if we kept leading the nation in job growth, all of that, where would we be? What would our businesses look like? What would our water supply look like? What would cost of congestion look like? What would transportation look like? So I could pose the question, is that what you want Texas to be in 2036? For those of you who are not students of Texas history, that will be our bicentennial of the formation of the republic. So it was a marketing gimmick. I could have picked 2040. But the point is, if we keep doing what we're doing, what kind of state will we have? And the picture was not pretty. It showed median family household income would decline, not only not increase sufficiently, would decline. Our cost of living advantage is shrinking. Uh, one projection we ran, a state uh, spending, the state budget would be consumed 75% by state health care spending, not the private sector what the state spends. So it's not a pretty picture. But I firmly believe the glass is at least half full, maybe two-thirds full. I wouldn't rather tackle these problems in any state but Texas. And we have time to address them. But if we don't do it now, and incrementally over time, in a smart way, then we stand a substantial risk, no offense, becoming California, Illinois, and New York, who waited and then just decided to throw money at the problem, business runs away, and you're in the downward spiral. So I remember I saw this presentation over at, uh, I think you were meeting at Mort Meyerson's, uh, at probably two, two and a half years ago, I guess, right. when you started, and you gave this presentation about median income and what the state would look like 20 years from now if we didn't fix things. Uh, and you've also talked about uh, uh, some of the issues with very uh, low uh, 
uh, literacy rates among the fastest growing demographic groups and some of the health care data that you've been collecting. I wonder if you just comment on both those, because for me, listening to you, it made a lot of sense, but also it was pretty jarring. Well, thanks to Houston Endowment, which many, many years ago undertook to do this, we have a state longitudinal database that tracks every single student in the state of Texas and what happens to them six years after high school graduation. Okay? So these are facts, folks. The facts are six years after high school graduation, only 23% of our last high school graduating class six years ago completed 14 years of education. What's the implication of that? In the economy of 2036, that means 77% of our population will qualify for a minimum wage job. That's the fact. The fact of the matter is the new high school the, the new job requirement of the future is not high school graduation. When I graduated from high school, you could graduate from high school, be a roughneck, make a good living, support a family, raise two children, buy a bass boat. No more. So in the future, they have to have at least 14 years of education to have more than minimum wage, and only 23% of our current native population is accomplishing that. Guess what? You cannot pay enough taxes to make up for that if that continues. How we covered up that? By enormous domestic and international migration, which is much better educated. Don't believe all the hype. You're, it's much better educated. The total combined domestic and international migration uh, whereas the native population about 23%, migration's about 47%, okay? So we've covered up our own deficiencies by enormous migration. And the Fed data shows domestic migration to this state has slowed. Now, it's slowing from record highs, so we're not yet ringing the, the bell, but it's slowing, International migration is slowing. So if they slow, then we're in a race to how quickly we can improve our native population, which is becoming younger, poorer, and older, and dropping out of the workforce. And I've heard this man talk in economics, and he says the function of GDP is population and productivity growth. <laughs> And uh, those are fundamental facts that this state is not grappling with. What's some of the uh, the uh, things you've learned from the healthcare data that you that you've uh, attained? Well, first of all, it's a huge challenge for this state and for the country. And let me state a position first because I get this a lot. Well, Tom, you don't understand. The federal government really controls health policy. Well, that's right to some extent, but it's not 100%, folks. And you can build a Texas plan, which gives us a competitive advantage by waivers, having a plan of how you spend your money. It's easier for the politicians to say, I can't do anything because they control that in Washington, and that's just not true. You can adapt, you can change, but then you'd have responsibility. So one, we have to develop our own plan, and in thematic purposes, we have to move from a health sick system to a health system. We spend, and to, I hope I don't offend anybody in this audience, to some extent I get a little irritated with the argument, is health care right? You know what, if you get run over by a car leaving this event, they're going to take you to the hospital and they're going to take care of you and not let you die, no matter what kind of insurance you do or don't have. We decide we're not going to let people die on the street. But we can either pay for health in stage five, like we do in our prisons, in our jails. The largest mental health facility in this state is Harris County Jail System. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars on psychiatric 
drugs in our jails because we don't pay for prevention or stage one or stage two of diseases and conditions. I'm old enough to remember when Betty Ford uttered a remarkable statement in those days. In those days, you didn't use the B word, breast, nor the C word, cancer. And she said she had breast cancer. And so we as a country decided, you know what, it'd probably be best if we found out if you had a lump and to take care of it in stage one or stage two, the societal benefits and the cost were better if you dealt with it in stage one or stage two. But we have a health sick system, and that's no, I mean, we have wonderful medical institutions, and they're part of the enormous GDP of this state. So how you transform those systems and have the state incentivize early treatment, early diagnosis, for instance, in mental health, uh, which is a huge passion of mine, um, I happen to find the data. There's only, this isn't the exact number I have it, there's only 1,751 cases of first episode psychosis that occur in this state in a year. The data shows, uh, first of all, first episode psychosis usually occurs between the age of 15 and 21. But 80% of the time, that adolescent doesn't get treatment till the third, fourth, or fifth episode, mm. by which time they've dropped out of school, they're separated from their family, their family doesn't know what to do, they don't have any infrastructure, they're on the street, they commit a crime, and then, guess what, we're going to get you some help. Well, that's like saying we're going to get your breast cancer fixed after metastasized. I mean, it's, it's just not as good. So how do we move a system? And again, you can't do that overnight the way we're set up. So this is about systems transformation. So we have to have a plan, and then we have to galvanize public support to say to the political figures, no, over time, address these problems and here are some practical, tactical problems to accomplish the strategic point. So let's let's talk about education first, then we're going to go to health care. If you had to say, to, uh, based on your work, to uh, elected officials and other, uh, other leaders in the state, here are one or two things we could do to improve education. Obviously, there was just a significant education reform, but from where we, where we are now, what are the one or two, three things you'd say, this, if you're going to pick one or two things, we should do these things to improve uh, to improve our education system. What would those things be? I'd pick three or four. Okay. One, every child has to be ready to enter first grade, ready to learn. Mm -hmm. That means child care must be developmental care. Child care beats no care. Okay? So I'm all for child care, but we need developmental care. We've got the brain research to know it really matters how you help the child get wired from three months to three or four years old. But we need every child to enter school ready to learn. How do we do that? Uh, we've got to change the way we deliver child care. We have to have developmental care. And, the, and let me say this. Not only government has to step up, business has to step up. You cannot have sufficient workforce unless you can galvanize and activate the female workforce, and child care is the biggest issue that we face. I started to say as a country, that's a big, but we face a lot of them. But you gotta, you got to address developmental care, and it has to be available and ready, and business has to play a role in that. Then number two, every child has to read at grade level by grade three, and our letter literacy research is awful. And we've got to do better, and we've got to set high standards. Our standards right now are so low that it's a joke. So this is expanded pre-K? It's expanded pre-K, but it's literacy training of our teacher core with research, best evidence, and practice. So inner child, inner ready to learn, read at grade level by grade three. I once did a longitudinal study of the entire state, and if a child was not at proficiency 
on reading at the end of grade three, only 4% ever reach proficiency the rest of their school career. You never want to give up, but folks, the game is basically up. In middle school, you have to pass Algebra 2 in middle school, not because you're going to use formulas in your job, but it's the critical ingredient in critical thinking skills. So we have to raise our horizons and quit arguing about algebra. That's how you critically think. And then in high school, that's how you problem solve. In high school, we have to set the standards which are really college ready. And the best barometer of that today, not to say there won't be another, but the data shows, for instance, if a Hispanic student passes one AP national exam in high school, the course does not matter. The college graduation rate goes from 12% to 82%. 12 to 82. But my motto for my grandchildren is you'll never exceed your own expectations. We do not have expectations that our minority students can and will take and pass an AP exam. And the truth of the matter is, even if you don't pass the national exam, the mere fact you tried and had a more challenging course improves your college success to 65%. So initiatives like uh, COMMIT, which you're very familiar with, um, the, the recent education reform passed by the state, what is your assessment on how some of those initiatives will, will uh, impact achievement of, of these three or four priorities you just went through? Necessary, but not sufficient. Okay. Totally supportive, had to be done, but we're just scratching the surface. And I don't blame Todd for the agenda. I mean, I'm not, sure. nor, I'm not blaming him. I'm praising him, but that's not Todd enough. Blames for those who, you know. It's not enough. Yep. And we got to get, we got to get real about this. And, uh, I'm saying to business leader, you need to understand this isn't just about the right thing to do. This is in your economic necessity and your economic self interest to make darn sure we go smarter and faster and quicker. Okay, so let's talk about the healthcare system and then I'm going to turn it to the audience. If you had to give recommendations, we have the highest number of uninsured in the, in the country uh, and a number of challenges with at-risk groups. What, are there are two or three recommendations you would make there. Yeah, we come, we got to come up with our own plan. And one, we have to talk about more than being uninsured. Being insured does not necessarily translate into access to the health care you need when you need it and where you need it. And right now, we have, pick a number, 174 counties in this state that you can't get an operation, you can't get a psychiatrist, we're running out of primary care uh, doctors, we have physician shortage, access matters, at the right time, at the right place. So we have to overhaul the healthcare system and the delivery of that system. We're very blessed in Houston and Dallas, you know, and have MD Anderson, Southwestern Medical School, all these great institutions, Baylor, Scott and White. Uh, you know, I go on and on. But this is more than specialization. It's more than operations. This is delivery. It is community health care and health population, which we are not addressing. Okay. So let me stop there, and let's go to the audience. Let's take your questions, and I'll come back and ask a few more, but please. Thank you, ma'am. When are you going to run for school and high school, it's it's over. Yeah. Um, I've taught eighth graders who read at the third grade level. Hispanics, the population, they they come from homes that 
they don't speak English in. It's very difficult. So that child care should be developmental care is critical. So how can businesses, like boots on the ground kind of thing, support that? Well, it's, it's the key to the future of our state. We have an enormous asset in our Hispanic population, and I mean that sincerely. We are so fortunate that we have such a um, long-term Hispanic population, and we have a culture that understands the strength of the Hispanic population. But we are doing a lousy job of incorporating the Hispanic population into our public school system, into our child care system. Um, and we, we have to address this in ways that are attuned to cultural needs, cultural understanding. Uh, this is a fascinating story. And by the way, in response to your first question, I tried running for governor once. It didn't work out real well. Um, <laughs> But 30 years ago, I had a very unique experience. I met with John Conley, and for there's maybe some of you in here that didn't know John Conley, but I mean, he was a big figure. He towered over a room, and he'd been a former governor of the state, and I went to call on him, and, and, and I said, uh, he walked me out the elevator being the politician he was. He said, Tom, when you're governor of the state, there's one thing I want you to do for me. And well, I perked up, first of all, he he was lying. He knew I wasn't going to be governor of Texas, but but he was he was a smooth talking, really bright guy. And he said, "There's one important thing you can do for this state." And I said, "What is it, governor?" He said, "I want you to require that every public school student in this state become bilingual." This was in 1990. He said, "The key to the future of our state is the Hispanic population." And we all need to become bilingual. And we need to totally embrace and absorb our Latino population. And I thought, of all the things John Conley would say to me, you know, I thought maybe talking about the oil and gas industry or this or that, he said, we need to understand that's the future of our state. We don't treat it that way. And we've got, we've got to do that. The, our Hispanic population is the key to the future of our state. And we face some uh, challenges in the Latino community. Uh, some of the, the, the ones that are the most uh, challenging are we still have people in the Hispanic community where the culture is it's okay for one to drop out of school when they're 14 or 15 and work 15, 16 hours a day to support the family. Uh, but that leads to uh, an environment where the income gaps cannot be closed. So we've got to address all of those needs, cultural, education, all of the above. And it's possible. It's doable. Um, let me tell you something. I've never met any parent of any race, ethnicity that did not want a better life for their children. And we have to, but we have to show them a path. In our data collection system now, we've, we've been able to, for the first time, any state, I can show you what happens to every child that graduates from the Texas public schools in the K through 12 system, through the community college system, through the higher education system, to the workforce, what happens to their earnings, what happens to their employment. And with that data, we can show you, here's what happens if you drop out and go to work now for the, your lifetime earnings. If you go to this community college and you take this major, Here's what happens to your earnings and employment. But if you take this major, here's what happens to your earnings and employment for your lifetime. Uh, so we need to use data. You know, you look at, look at the private world, uh, private sector. Data is the new energy. I mean, for crying out loud, businesses are being disrupted and run by data collection and analytics. And we're in the stone ages. So let me ask you, I think because of your work and work of others, 
Uh, if I talk to business leaders, community leaders, we happen to have uh, Claudia Aguirre is on our as a, on our Dallas Fed board runs Head Start here in Houston. Baker Ripley, uh, I, t- I t- spend time you have too with the governor, lieutenant governor, people, in le- they they get it. But I've noticed there's still questions on is it expanded pre K, is it teacher salaries, uh, and then Houston, I think Houston is wrestling with. What, what do we do, and who's supposed to do it? Um, and I think there's still some confusion about it. How would you, how would you co- address that? How would you comment on that? Well, we, uh, one, that's correct. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's all the above. But number two, we're not organized for success. And uh, Margaret Spellings, who we persuaded to become our CEO, came up with that phrase, and it's a wonderful phrase. Jurisdictionally and governmentally, we're not organized for success. Yeah. Who's got responsibility? Who's accountable? How many jurisdictions do we have? We've got to tackle it. But again, you can't do that overnight. You cannot disrupt. But you look at the number of water districts. You look at the number of... So who can fix that? Uh, the people. Okay. Let me tell you, there's good news and bad news about a democracy. And it is you get what you deserve. Okay. I mean, stop and think about it. Really, you get what you deserve. We have poor voter turnout. We don't speak up. We don't vote. Now, I believe, and our thesis is, if we could galvanize the public behind a real actionable plan that they could articulate and hold public officials accountable against, then you could change. I mean, we're Texas. I mean, you know... We can do anything we want to do. What are we, the 10th world? Will, will you publish, will you eventually in your, in 2036, will you publish plans and specific templates for maybe what we should do so the public can become more aware of the work you're doing? Absolutely. We, we're going to do two things. We're going to create and publish. We hope next year we're calling it draft 1.0 to say, okay, folks, let's go argue about this. I'd love to start a debate, but I learned a long time ago as a lawyer, I always want to do the first draft of the contract. So we're going to do the first draft. Nobody ever signed my first draft when I drafted, even though I was fair, just, and reasonable. (laughs) But I I think we're going to lay out a first draft, and then let's argue about it. Good. But I want it to be aspirational, not what's politically possible. And then once we can galvanize public support around that, Then you back up from that and say, okay, what's a bite-sized chunk we could do in the 21 session, the 23 session, the 25 session? But I've tried to explain to my seven grandsons, if you get on the highway, it helps if you know you're going to Oklahoma City or Laredo. (laughs) You ought to at least know what directionally are you trying to achieve, or you'll never get there. So we need a plan, and then we need that because... Okay, good. I love this is live. Hi, um, Eusebio Diaz with the Episcopal Health Foundation. Um, and thank you for your help and support. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, we, we talk about um, folks like me, like we're the answer and the, um, the questions sometimes to um, what this state needs. But we're rarely at the table where decisions are made. Um, Looking at your board, it's a great board, but we are lacking in representation on that board. So who who is lacking representation? Um, 2036. Okay. Well, are you talking about Houston or the Episcopal Health Foundation? Um, No, I'm talking about the um, your board, Texas 2036. Okay. Okay. I think you'll find it's racially and ethnically diverse. It's continually expanding. Our goal is to eventually have a board that reflects the diversity of our state, both in the future and in the present. And the Episcopal Health Foundation is a key player in our health care advisory group. And you keep saying the right things, so thank you. And if you have suggestions, Tom, you'd probably say... And not, if you, and have, if you have suggestions, have, bring them on. If you have suggestions, Tom would probably be open to hearing totally. them about members totally. of that board. All right. Totally. All right. I have I have one business card. Only if you'll use it, I'll give it to Great. you. Great. <laughs> Feel free. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening. My name is Antonio Tov. I'm a, a sophomore at Rice University, and 
over the course of this summer, I got the chance to, I got to speak to you earlier, I got the chance to work at the Department of Education. And so I want to ask this question you've been talking about, data-driven decision-making, essentially, this day, utilizing data. And uh, I got the chance to talk to Secretary DeVos and newly confirmed Secretary Bob King about these new moves to utilize this on a federal level, this new data-driven decision-making, taking a look at teacher outcomes and things of the sort. I want to ask, where do you see that being utilized on the state level, uh, either the State Department of Education or state entities to use data to better improve teacher outcomes and things of that sort? I don't see it very often. Um, I'm a huge fan of Mike Morath, who's the current chairman of the Texas Education Agency. And I, I really mean that. That's not a backhanded compliment. He's terrific. But when I showed Mike what we'd been able to do on data, he said, where have you been all my life? I was told this couldn't be done. And I said, well, Mike, I did it. It's all public data. Here it is. He said, thank God, what else do you need? Hmm. I showed it to the governor's people uh, what we'd done, and they said, my God, how'd you do this? And, and one staff member spoke up and said, well, we were told it couldn't be done. I said, well, here it is. And the second one spoke, and well, I was told it could be done, but it would cost $3 billion. How much did you spend? I said, well, it depends on allocation overhead, but I can assure you it didn't start with a B. Um, when I served in the Texas Sunset Commission with the backing of the House Appropriations Committee Chair <coughs> and the Senate Appropriations Chair, I asked the Commissioner of Health and Human Services, how much does the state spend on mental health? He said, I don't know. I said, well, you will find out. Two and a half years later, he presented back to the committee a spreadsheet that said the state spent $6.5 billion. He did not have a dashboard or the data analytics to be able to do that. And he didn't know on what stage of the disease or condition that was spent on. Our state government spends 2% of their budget on uh, IT. Uh, most states spend 4 Business spends a higher percentage. Two-thirds of our state agencies self-report they cannot do data analytics. Doesn't seem to be a world I recognize hmm. in with the Googles, the Microsofts, the Apples, the Dells of the world. But that's where we are, folks. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, my name is William Petrie. I have a small company called uh, Star Educational Empl Empowerment Seminars. And 35 years ago, I worked with a young lady who introduced her concept of employer-assisted child care. It, it fits so closely into what you were just talking about, being able to have the, the child care on campus, uh, on the business campus, um, for the, the new mom. It, it's being done, and that way they're getting those connections that they needed both the connections that they need with their mother during those early years, as well as the connection that they get from an educational standpoint. Um, in reading through some of your information, what I wasn't finding was the connection that we have in financial education in um, elementary, middle, and high schools, as far as how that lack of it being done here in Texas um, currently would translate to the future successes of Texan children as well as Texas businesses. Well, a two-part question there. Let me take the first. Uh, one, I, I do believe we need to work with the private sector to figure out how to get the private sector engaged. Again, I believe you do that through public-private partnerships. You've got to figure out how to engage the private sector to make it realistic. Number two, I, my dream has always been larger. I'd love to see somebody like the Texas Medical District or... Texas Instruments are huge employers one day say, I'd like to house on my property a K through 12 public school or child age two through high school through a community college on my campus. And I'm going to use that as a recruitment tool and I'm going to get the state to say any employee of ours regardless of whether they live in Katy or the Woodlands or Houston ISD, can go to this public school if you work here. 
Parents can come there for lunch, go meet with a teacher. Believe me, the business would be invested in the success of that school. And so there's lots of things we can do if we truly convince ourselves that the future of our state and of our business is absolutely wrapped up in this happening. Yes, please. Thank you. Jeanette Lindner, Veritas Total Solutions, a management consulting firm specializing in tough, solving tough problems in the energy industry. I'm from Brownsville, Texas, and was honored to actually stand on this stage a few months ago and give a presentation about how I got to where I am. And I think a lot of the changes that you made in the 80s in Texas directly impacted my educational outcomes and opportunities. Um, it's a multi multifaceted problem, I think, that we're, that 2036 is trying to address. As we talk about what the how you measure success in education, and we've seen you know many failed attempts at saying it's 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 you know tests it's star it's this and that. What is your response to how do you measure success besides just graduating from high school or just graduating from college? We have to have multi measures just like a business does, even the enterprise does. There's no one measure. You, you have to have multi, but you have to have measures. You have to know how you're doing. You have to be, any enterprise needs to be able to assess how they're doing. No measurement's perfect. Um, but as I used to say, we, we cannot let perfect be the enemy of good. And no assessment measure is perfect. But if you have multiples, and you're not unfair in your reading of those, then it's better than current systems which don't really have any mm. way of measuring success. But there have to be multiple. But let me give you one. Let me go back to the data again. It is inexcusable in today's digital world that of all of our hundreds of thousands of students that take a community college course cannot know in an instant if I register for this course and I get a grade X, which college will take this course in transfer? Period. Hmm. It's inexcusable. And that's why we have, you know, we have hundreds of thousands of students that are running up debt they don't finish their community college degree. They don't finish their higher education degree. That's criminal. And it's inexcusable in today's age. Sir. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Uh, I, I remember uh, Governor Perry saying we have to eliminate education department. I'm glad all Texans don't think that way, by the way. So, um, so my question is about uh, income inequality and how to leverage technology to, you know, break the cycle of poverty. For example, in our, I, I'm a member of a nonprofit. What we focus is uh, educating young kids, age of nine to thirteen, in core science, STEM-related education. Basically, if you can give them appropriate education in science and technology, then you can really break the cycle of poverty. So my question is, what is the role of technology in education? And how do you can use it to bridge income inequality and break the cycle of poverty? Golly, there's so many issues wrapped up in that. Let, let me address a couple of them. Number one, um, we have a huge social mobility issue in addition to an inequality issue. I've seen some data, again, when I was born in 1940, 95% of the People born in 1940 ended up making roughly 30 to 33 percent more than their parents. That has steadily declined ever since. And part of the problem is mobility. It's, you know, listen, in the 1890s and the robber baron, I may have the year, we had a lot of income inequality, but we had a lot of social mobility. And people move from the first quadrant to the second quadrant to the third quadrant to the fourth quadrant, and everybody believed in the American dream. Our social mobility is plugged. There are barriers. We need more mobility. 
and that's part of the problem that we're dealing with. That is exacerbated. Here, these are the facts. These are not. This is not a. This isn't a politically incorrect statement. I've seen a breakdown of what happens in second immigration, second generation immigration populations versus second and third current residents, and the mobility is not moving. And that's our all of our responsibility. STEM is a critical part of it. Technical jobs are a part of that. But basically, those jobs are going to dramatically change. We've had, we've had a, a study done by McKinsey, and you know, there will be as many job disruptions as there are job create. You can't, you know, I, I don't like the word vocational education. Just because, you know, the truth of the matter is, if you're going to have a living wage, you're going to have 10 or 12 jobs in, in the lifetime of a kid that graduates from school today. You have to pay attention to what skills are needed. And again, business bears part of this problem. They opt out and take lazy way out and say, well, we need a high school degree or we need a community college degree or we need X or we need Y. No, you've got to articulate more what you need. I share with Rob this story. I challenged ExxonMobil once to say, does somebody working in your petrochemical plant actually have to have mastered Algebra 2? They said, we don't know the answer to that. But they dug into it for a year, and they came back and said, yes. Yes. No, they don't need a college degree. No, they don't need a community college degree. But by golly, they need to have mastered Algebra 2. Hmm. And, the, and business needs to be at the table and challenge hired. No, we're not going to take your badges and your certificates anymore. We want the following. So we all bear responsibility on this. We can't just say, well, you did this, you did that. We're all in this together. So can I ask you a sensitive question? And, I'm, and we are in Houston, um, so I, it's very sensitive maybe. But business community is 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 stepped up to that, but they're struggling with trying to figure out from a governance point of view, I'll say uh, euphemistically, from a governance point of view, how to get their arms around this so they can make changes. Yeah, I hate to ask you any advice you'd have, because sensitive, any advice you'd have on what the hell they should do They've got to be very proactive and just by golly get everybody in a room and say this has to be done. They got to get the community colleges on the table, they got to get the workforce development people on the table and the K through 12 system in the table, they get all, got to get all the players in the room and say, we're, not, we're locking the doors. But they have to step up and say, what do we really need? Mm -hmm. And then they have to stay involved. And they have to hold people accountable. All right, let's take one more. Thanks. My name is Kim Walker. I'm the broker and owner of Kim Walker Real Estate. And my question is uh, regarding... Uh, something you had mentioned earlier as far as the state of Texas tracks every uh, from eighth grade through the next six years of, of the students, every student that we graduate, uh, at least through the eighth grade proficiency in reading and then, uh, or sorry, third grade level proficiency in reading and then Algebra 2 in eighth grade. We really stop at eighth grade assessment except for... Eight, that's fine. So what I want to know is as specific metrics. Big data is great, but it gets very complicated very quickly. I was curious, as far as keeping our elected officials and the state of Texas kind of on the hook and pressuring to make yeah. sure we hit those metrics, do we track the state cost of entitlement spending for those that fall below the poverty line or never will recover as far as when they have a family and they're already working as far as they can, but they, they didn't pass algebra and they can't read proficiently, how much entitlement spending for the state does that cost? Do we track that number? Thanks. We're going to do our dead level best to make absolutely certain we can. And number two, I, my dream and vision uh, and I've told a lot of uh, people who are helping us financially 
look, all these political candidates come to you, both parties. This is a bipartisan statement. Mm -hmm. We're bipartisan. We're nonpartisan. They all come to you, and they tell you they're for education and infrastructure <laughs> and motherhood and the flag. In the future, I want you to hand on this 2036 strategic plan and say, young woman, I assume this is what you mean when you say you're for education. And Tom's going to have the data when you come back four years from now to see what exactly did you do to move forward the 2036 action plan. And that's what I'm going to grade you on. And I'm going to have the data to see if you're moving the needle. All right. So on that, and, and I apologize to those. This is not a political statement. Applies to both parties. Someday, I'd like both party or all parties to be arguing who could best implement the 2036 plan that all of us think should be done. So let me ask you one final question. I apologize to those who've been waiting. We're just not going to be able, in the interest of time, get get to you. But if this is obviously a group of business leaders, community leaders, people who care about. Uh, uh, this subject and wanting to make the community and the state and the country a better place. If you had to give them one or two pieces of advice on actions they could take personally, that other would than help them supporting us. Well, <laughs> you, you no. if they want to support you, uh, how would they go about doing it, and what else could they do to help further this cause? Well, um, you know, seriously, I wish you would go to our website, text2036.org. Uh, it, it's important for us not only to have financial support, but thought partners. And it's important for us to have people asking the right questions of public officials. That's important. Empowered with the right data. Because most public officials, again, is, both parties, they want to talk about what's good. They want to talk about what looks good. We lead the nation in job growth. But if you're prepared to say, well, but here's the data on X. What are we going to do about this? That, again, in a democracy, you get what you deserve. That's the good news and bad news. But it depends upon you to be making informed questions and informing the debate. Uh, there are some of our current state officials who the first time they were elected were elected by 3% of the registered eligible voters in our state. 3%. That's not very good, folks. That's an indictment of us, not them. All right, Tom Luce, thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for your leadership. <laughs>